Please welcome so. Dr. Mark Armitage. Thank you. Thank you. Microscopist. Thank you, brother. Fellow journalist. It's so good to be here with you. Thank you for this great honor to be the first one to kick off your series here. Okay, I'm technologically challenged with everything but microscopes. But with microscopes, I'm really good. So, what you're going to see today, uh, and, I, and I do really want to encourage you to watch the videotaped presentation from this morning, because we, t we discussed Dimetrodon. Uh, we have, up until recently, only dug in the Cretaceous, which is uh, surmised to be some 70 million years old or a little bit younger. And uh, the amount of soft tissue that we're finding is abundant. I made the prediction in 2012 that this would be the norm rather than the exception, and that's now proven true. And so I would encourage you to see that presentation because we're not only finding blood clots in Dimetrodon, and I'll explain that, why that's significant, but we're also finding the best nerves we've ever seen, even better than these nerves that we pulled out of Triceratops. We're finding better preservation in the Permian, which is... Uh, at about 275 to 290 million years old, according to the literature. So, uh, I'll tell you a little secret. We're actually also looking in the Devonian, which is 100 million years even earlier than that, and plenty of preservation there. So, it's a great presentation. It's brand new. It was just published in a journal this week, and uh, so I encourage you to get that video. The Dinosaur Soft Tissue Research Institute is a 501c3 organization, we're a research organization. We go to the digs, we bring the fossils back, we prepare them, we extract the soft tissues from them, and we publish, but we present also at scientific meetings. So we're going to some of these meetings. Uh, we're also speaking on college campuses. Uh, we're gonna speak at uh, University of Texas El Paso in February. We spoke at Penn State University and State College in November. And that was broadcast online, and the comments coming in from the students who were saying, I cannot believe I'm hearing what you're saying, was fantastic. So uh, we would appreciate your encouragement and support as we go out and take this uh, to the world, because the world needs to hear this, and they're not. They're not hearing it. So that's why we're going out on the road. But uh, please watch the lecture from this morning. This afternoon, I thought what I would do... Uh, I'm going to tag team with our president here, Keith Holcomb, who's going to address you at the end. But I wanted to show you some of the latest, greatest stuff right off the bench. So this is stuff that I photographed last week. So this work is ongoing, and you'll get to see some of this. So uh, in, in uh, May, no, actually it was uh, October, uh, we went to Montana, 2021. Before that, we went to the Permian in Oklahoma, which was the talk this morning. But we did end up going back to the Hell Creek, and we dug there, mostly for Nanotyrannus. Now, Nanotyrannus is a controversial dinosaur because some people claim it's a T-Rex, a juvenile T-Rex. But it has some very distinguishing features that uh, distinguish it from T-Rex. So we think it's a brand new dinosaur that uh, is controversial and that's why we're going to collect tissues on it because it's already controversial so you know you want to tie your kite under one of those strings right uh, so we collected mostly nanotyrannus I do have a nanotyrannus rib up here I mislabeled it uh, this is this is nanotyrannus and you guys can come up and handle these bones by the way after the talk and we also have some permian limbs here that you can look at but we collected nanotyrannus teeth, claw, vertebrate, rib. Um, we didn't get jaw, but we got quite a bit of material, some, some long limb bones, which are beautiful. And so we dissolved those. We, we wrecked the fossils, right? Uh, paleontologists don't like us because we actually destroy them. We turn them into mud, frankly, uh, through our decalcification process. And then we extract the tissues. And this is what we're going to teach the kids to do, the students. My philosophy is if you want to reach a PhD secular scientist, train a 13-year-old and they'll teach him because they'll do it. They'll do the job. So that's what we're trying to do. All right, so let me show you some of the results that we got from Nanotyrannus. Um, we found beautiful claws. By the way, I have a very powerful pointer here. It's low tech, but it works really well. So that's a claw, Nanotyrannus. These are fresh out of the ground. Okay, they're almost pristine. These are buried in sand. So there's really hardly any digging. It's mostly just shaving the sand away with a spatula. Uh, teeth, 
uh, beautiful teeth, and the, the nanotyrannus teeth are serrated on both sides. So this was a steak knife coming and going, yeah? He could slice right through you. Uh, plenty of limb bones, uh, I showed you. This is actually part of this rib that is presently in decal in my lab and we're pulling beautiful nerves and cells out of this and you'll get to see some of those. Uh, this is one of the long limb bones that I was talking about. I mean this, this is upwards of uh, six, seven inches long and, and we found longer ones. Remember this work started by looking at femurs only. The scientists who first worked with the, uh, soft tissue were mostly using femurs. Why? It's a big strong bone, yeah? It's fully encapsulated. It's got a really thick amount of compact bone around the outside and then all the spongy, spongy trabecular bone in the, in the inside and that's where a lot of soft tissue is. So everybody was going out looking for femurs. Well we went looking for a femur, we found a horn. It was fractured, broken up, wet, full of plant roots, fungal bodies. We counted the DNA of 60 different individual animals uh, and plants in this, this very specimen. So how is this soft tissue here after that onslaught? I don't know. I don't know why it's here. But the preservation mechanisms that uh, our colleagues are proposing don't work. And if you watch that presentation this morning and you look at the cl blood clots, you'll understand that your blood clots when you drown. And we're finding clots in every single one of the bones that we thin section. That means they all drown. So there's hard clinical scientific evidence that it was a drowning event that was the demise of these creatures. Anyway, the preservation is fabulous. Like I say, you just dig them out of sand. This is all just sand. See that? It's all just sand. And there's, you, you, you go up against the wall and you just dig into the wall. And you find bone after bone after tooth after claw. It's amazing. So uh, if you want to come on a dig with us, let us know. We'll probably put you to work, but you'll have a great time too. Uh, we go on uh, three or four different sites a year. Uh, this is a limb bone. You can see the trabecular bone inside uh, where I broke this piece away. This is already yielding soft tissues. So uh, this is a vertebra, nanotyrannus vertebra. This is really producing some really interesting clots, which you're going to see. In fact, here they are. So what I did is I lightly decalcified this. This is pre-decalcification. What is decalcification? It's a weak acid. EDTA is a weak acid that is used in hospitals every day of the week to dissolve bones, human bones. So when you go in and you have a pathology in your bone and they take a section of it, a biopsy of it, they process that, they put it through decal, they get rid of all the bone mineral and they look at the tissue to find the disease. We're doing the exact same thing on bones that are supposed to be so old that they've turned into rock, but folks, they're all bones. The, the numbers of permineralized specimens that we come up with are mostly rare. It's this that is common. <laughs> so most people are under the mistaken impression that these are rock, and they're not rock. We're using standard protocols to dissolve them. So when I, when I dissolve this a little bit, I put it in decal for just a couple of days just to see what would happen, and it, it exposed the layer of compact bone just below the outer, uh, just below the outer shaft of bone, and you can see all of these Haversian blood canals in here. So these are the blood canals where the blood vessels travel. Every single one of them is clotted. And that's at the surface. We haven't even gotten into the interior of the bone yet. Right? So this is systemic clotting all the way to the edge of the bone. So that was pretty exciting. Here's a, a magnified clot from this uh, lower power micrograph here. So I magnified it. You can see the Haversian canal. Here's the Haversian bone. This, any anatomist will recognize this. And that's the vessel. You can see the thin vessel wall in here and the clot on the inside. So clot after clot after clot after clot we have photographed. There's also another very interesting phenomena that happens uh, when iron from the blood is reduced through oxidation, Fe203 or uh, Fe... I guess it's Fe2S with, with sulfide, but they make these framboids. These are little circles. A lot, of, a lot of people have commented, oh, those are red blood cells. No, they're not. They're, when iron is exposed to oxidation, uh, it forms these circular framboids. 
and um, they're prevalent in these canals. And so we see them not only in decalcified bone uh, where we've exposed a little bit of the canal, but we also see them in thin sections. All the, uh, all the thin sections that we make are full of these framboids also inside the canals. And I think I have some pictures of that to show you. Here's a little higher magnification. You can see these little tiny framboids in here. That's all iron. So the, this is the remnants of the blood. You can see the canals. There's a canal, there's a canal, there's a canal. They're all going that way into the bone. And so this is the iron left over from the blood. So when we make a thin section then of the bone, we can see uh, the canal. This is the bone canal here. And all of this dark stuff, that's the clot. You can see it going off into another canal. See this little canal here? So there's, this is a, probably a Volksmann canal uh, between two Haversian canals. But this is all clotted blood. It's all crystallized. Here's a framboid. Okay, so now you're seeing a framboid in thin section. And then we put it under UV. And looky there. This whole framboid is iron. So that's iron from the blood. These are probably crystallized blood proteins in the center. So uh, we had a physician look at some of our iron pictures and he started naming all the proteins that he could see crystallized in there. So there are smart enough people who know what these things are and can name them. But this is from the Camarasaurus. So this is the, uh, the animal that uh, Dr. Baugh is digging out of the ground in Colorado. And we went there, was that two years ago, I think? And uh, we got those specimens and we did a preliminary test with the UV. And now we believe uh, we've got a project with the Camarasaurus, which is a really big animal. It had that big Diplodocus-like neck and small head, big body, big legs, long tail. You know, probably 35, 40 feet long, all told. So he's a big animal and he's been studied a lot. So this, this is going to make a big splash if we can go into the bones that Dr. Baugh has already collected and identify, you know, rib, vertebra, things like that, femurs, limb bones. Once we identify uh, the bone that we're working with, then we can talk about its anatomy properly in the publication. So that, that's a project that we're really looking forward to working on. Uh, this is a picture of first decal of some of that nanotyrannus. So these are the first fibers uh, that we pulled out of this nanotyrannus bone. It has a crosshatch right there. This is a diagnostic feature. The way nerves are constructed, uh, there are tissues called epineurium and perineurium that go around the, uh, the vessel in a crosshatch pattern, like a double helix all the way around. That's an insulation around the nerves right, that transmit electrical signals, yeah? So just like your coax cable has a rubber coating on the outside to insulate it, these nerves are insulated with a similar tissue that adopts that same uh, conformation, that same structure. So this is what's called a diagnostic feature. When you see this crosshatch in a fiber that glows in polarized light, you know you have a nerve. Now, not only are we finding nerves, but we're finding lipids. And I'm going to show you those in a second. But these are pictures of the Permian dig that we did in May in Oklahoma. Here's the Dimetrodon femur that we talked about this morning. So yeah, you want to watch that video. Um, we're also in a partnership with the Oklahoma Museum of Natural History. And they're literally giving us some of the most precious bones on Earth to destroy. The Permian um, pelicosaurs. Uh, Things like amphibians and reptiles that go back to that 290 million years that they say. Uh, now, <laughs> what's funny about these specimens is most of them are highly concentrated in Oklahoma. Not all around the world. <laughs> we have dinosaurs all over the world, but we only have Permian in select places. There's one tiny place in Europe, but most of them come out of the, the uh, Archer County, Texas red beds, which I understand are in water now, I think, right? They've flooded that with a lake. I don't know. I don't live here. I live in Seattle. <laughs> you got to tell me. But the other place is the Fissure Fills in uh, Richard Spur, Oklahoma. The highest concentration of Permian fossils, which are supposed to be 290 million years old and traveled 8,000 miles. Remember Pangaea? 
all the all the continents were in one big land mass, right? And over 290 million years, it traveled 8,000 miles to where it is now in Oklahoma. But there's no scratches on them. So, yeah, how did that happen? How did that concentration happen? And uh, we're pulling beautiful nerves out of these bones. Be the best nerves that we photographed have come out of these bones. So, it's it's shocking. It's really shocking. But Oklahoma Museum of Natural History has thrown their doors open to us and they've provided us with some fabulous specimens that we intend to work with and pull up clots. We're seeing clots in these and nerves. Uh, okay, here is a dimetrodon bone that was polished part way. Uh, it was affixed to a slide and then the whole thing was set in decal. So we decalcified away the bone that was sitting on top of this, and you see clot after clot after clot after clot after clot, right? And then you see the collagen fibers in here. Those are all the collagen fibers. And these little dots, those are the bone cells. So there's a lot of work to do, and uh, we need helpers to help us do this. Here's another very interesting area of study, and that is when these bones permineralize. Remember I mentioned most of them are still bone, but sometimes, uh, they were uh, infiltrated by a highly saturated solution of silica uh, or quartz or other uh, minerals, highly saturated solutions, and, and those evaporated and crystallized over time, and mineral replacement took place. So all the biological molecules were swapped, right, for minerals. So it's a hard rock. But we're finding that in the calcite, which is clear, calcite, is clear and in the calcite are suspended framboids and what might pass for red blood cells. So we're seeing all kinds of tissues preserved in clear rock. So it's and it's it's got the same refractive index as our uh, manuf our microscope objectives. So the clarity is unparalleled and this is such an important area of study that the microscopy site of America a couple of years ago in their annual meeting called for papers for nothing but tissues preserved in calcite. So it's a very hot area of study that we're looking to get into but here's a Haversian canal and these are framboids. All those red iron framboids frozen in place in that calcite. Look at this beautiful swirl here along the, 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 the canal wall. So this is the wall. You're looking down the canal. Here's the bone around the canal. You can see osteocytes in there. Those are all the little cells. And these are framboids suspended in calcite. So this is a very important area of study that we hope to develop and work with. Here's an osteocyte right here. You see the little philopodia sticking out. And, and look, at, look at the preservation of these. Those look exactly like red blood cells to me. Yeah, They're a little bit bigger. They're a little larger than RBCs. So I have a colleague in Southern California who often looks at my material, uh, second pair of eyes, and so I send him a lot of decalcification slides and he returned with this picture and he said, well here's here's osteocytes in here, they're, they're pretty corroded, you can see a philopodia here, but then he said there's this unknown fiber in here. That's not unknown, I know exactly what that is. That's a nerve. This could possibly be the world's first picture of a nerve in Dimetrodon right here. I can see the, the folding of the surrounding uh, outer you know, covering, the epineurium and perineurium. So I recognize it. And he sent me several pictures like that. I don't know what these fibers are. I know what they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's the Haversian canal, blood products in there. Look at these beautiful osteocytes, all in dimetrodon. Yeah. How can they be there? Okay. Let's talk about fat. <laughs> you like to talk about fat? <laughs> Most of us don't. Why? We're self-conscious, right? I'm finding lipids, fats, in these nerves that I'm pulling out of these Permian bones. That's like taking a bottle of Wesson oil, pouring it out on the ground and coming back 100 million years later and expecting it to be... Come on! Come on! I'm putting pressure on these under the cover slip on the microscope slide and lipids are oozing out. How can that be? Right? Look at all the lipids that I oozed out of this nerve. Look at all these lipids here, those droplets. That can't be there. Why is that there? I love this picture. I can't wait to hopefully get this on the cover of a journal. 
here's a nerve I'm squeezing, and look at this trail of do droplets that's going completely. And if you look at this under the microscope, you can see these faint droplets going all the way. Those are lipids oozing out of a nerve. Yeah? That's pretty conclusive, wouldn't you say? That's K-Cops, which is another Permian uh, reptile. Big, big lipids. And these lipids are stained a little bit. In fact, if we go back to this first slide, look how stained these are. The lipids are clear, but these are stained gray. You see that? That's because I put this nerve in osmium tetroxide. That's a heavy metal stain. And so it's staining lipids. So I know I have lipids because they're staining and they're behaving the way lipids generally behave.